Attorney General, welcome. I appreciate the time. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Larry. Always good to be on with you. Thank you. I, I'm sure you, if you probably noticed from our timeline, a lot of people are anxious about Breonna Taylor. We'll get to that. Um, but I, I want to ask you. I want to ask you a little bit about uh, about Casey's law. I know some some uh, some constitutional challenges regarding the COVID nineteen. We'll get to that first, and then we'll address the, the Breonna Taylor stuff here in just a, a moment. Uh, you know, we had uh, Senator Damon Thayer, who actually was on the ground floor of Casey's law back, I think, in two thousand five, and now it's being contested. Um, and for people who don't know what that's about, it's it's. It's legislation that allows family and friends to get court-ordered drug treatment for loved ones. Where, where does this stand, and what's your position uh, on Casey's law and the, the chances of surviving its contest? Yeah, well, um, we filed a brief uh, last week in support of Casey's law. This office is fully in support uh, of a law that ultimately, uh, in our judgment, and in my judgment in particular, uh, help save lives in the Commonwealth as it relates to uh, opioid abuse and drug addiction uh, here in Kentucky. You're no stranger to the numbers. I think we lost uh, most recently 1,247 individuals to overdoses uh, as, as, as far as the most recently reported numbers. Uh, and so we want to do everything we possibly can to stand up and uh, get folks help who, who need help. Uh, Casey's Law is a terrific avenue uh, to be able to do that. You mentioned uh, Leader Thayer, uh, Damon Thayer, who back in 2004 was very helpful uh, to this piece of legislation. It passed unanimously in the, uh, the state Senate and passed on a vote of 94 to 1 in the state, uh, state House. And so there's been broad, uh, almost unanimous support as it relates to the representation here in Frankfurt uh, regarding uh, Casey's law. I was just with uh, 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 Casey's uh, uh, mother, Charlotte Wethington, uh, last week. Mm -hmm. her, she continues to be passionate about this issue, um, and obviously her son being the namesake of this law, uh, it is of utmost importance that we continue to help save lives here in Kentucky, and Casey's law allows us to do that. Attorney General, we we had a lot of folks that were listening to the interview with uh, Senator Thayer, and uh, and some were pointing out that they feared that Casey's law could be abused and and uh, and be used for purposes that it was not intended to do. Is is that an invalid or a valid concern? And what are the concerns of people that are pushing back on this law? Well, um, the Department of Public Advocacy has raised the challenge as it relates to to, to Casey's law's constitutionality. Uh, they've basically uh, put forth a, a, a few different arguments. One, uh, which is the, uh, their, their concern about a due process, whether it be substantive or, or procedural. Uh, there's an equal protection challenge as well as a, a First Amendment concern. Uh, but we thoroughly believe uh, that this law passes constitutional muster. Uh, there are mechanisms in place uh, within the civil context uh, that allows for uh, an individual that uh, is potentially going to be a court order to go to treatment, uh, that they have avenues uh, and can be appointed a lawyer in the event that they don't want to go down that route. So we fully believe uh, that a individual's uh, rights are protected as it relates to uh, substantive and procedural due process um, and think that this, again, law uh, saves lives here in the Commonwealth and something that is a passion of mine and something that I've talked about for a year now is how can we in the AG's office be a good neighbor and a good partner uh, as it relates to uh, reducing the number of drug overdoses and drug addiction here in Kentucky. Uh, Casey's Law is an avenue to do that. It is a tool in the toolbox for my judgment. We're going to uh, talk more about this tomorrow. We've got uh, the White House's drugs are Jim Carroll on the program to talk about uh, about this very thing. Uh, we're talking with Attorney General uh, Daniel Cameron. I want to talk to you a little bit about the COVID-19 executive orders. Now, you're on the other side of this where you're challenging the constitutionality of Governor Bashir's COVID-19 executive orders. Why, why, why should the governor be able to have an executive order that's designed to keep people safe during a pandemic? Uh, just, just give me your, your thought process uh, as to why you think he's overstepping his bounds. Well, look, I, I've, I've said from the beginning that uh, I certainly understand the need for all of our elected officials, President Trump, uh, to uh, Governor Bashir, to our uh, county judges and mayors, their uh, need to keep our community safe and, and keep folks healthy during the midst of this pandemic. Uh, there's no uh, disagreement there. 
What we have tried to do as it relates to the uh, uh, lawsuits uh, that we've joined or, or, or filed or, or provided supporting documents on is judge uh, what are the constitutionality of those orders? Are they too broad in their um, in the way that they are applied to Kentuckians? Uh, should they be narrowly tailored to more specifically address uh, the, the, the ongoing concerns? Uh, again, we are in the position uh, of agreeing that we have to keep and maintain uh, safety of, of our citizens during this pandemic. Uh, but what we've seen in some of the orders that have been issued, whether it be uh, the church ban uh, that was initially uh, proposed and implemented by the governor or the travel ban that was proposed and implemented by the governor uh, and some of the more recent uh, orders that we have challenged, is the fact that we think he's just overstepped in terms uh, of the application of those orders. Uh, in some instances, they seem to be arbitrary uh, and overly broad. And so in each instance, um, the law has been on our side. And we've seen that uh, judges, whether it be uh, at the state level uh, or uh, the federal level, have looked at some of these orders and said that they need to be uh, constrained. Uh, and in some instances, they've been, been thrown out summarily. So uh, we recognize the importance of keeping people safe uh, people are being asked to be wise and considerate of their uh, family members, of of their uh, other citizens here in Kentucky and their neighbors. Uh, but we want to also make sure that we are protecting the constitutional rights of Kentuckians. Attorney General, do, do you see hypocrisy in how people are viewing, uh, you know, some of these mandates? Where if if it's a protest, it's deemed legitimate, then uh, then it's condemned. But if it's uh, more virtuous or it's viewed more virtuous, therefore people seem to look the other way on it. I mean, I know a lot of our callers and listeners and people around the country feel like that that these mandates seem to be very strict when when the people in charge don't think uh, the reaction is you know. I guess just for whatever we will look at it, but but if it's a protest for something they believe is virtuous and necessary, needed, then it's perfectly okay to break mandates and and to not to abide. Do you do you see where people might think that that's you know, unfair or maybe arbitrary, as you pointed out? Well, look, that's one of the reasons. You know, let's just use for instance, uh, or for example, uh, the ban on in-person church services. Uh, one of the things that we found uh, in, 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 in joining and, and ultimately uh, being a part of those uh, lawsuits related to uh, the governor's ban on in-person church services is that you could uh, very well go to a big box store um, on Saturday and look in the parking lot uh, and see countless cars in that parking lot and know uh, that there were hundreds of people in a particular box store Yet you go to a church parking lot, uh, and it would be vacant, uh, even though the church uh, and our our ability to worship here in the in this country is protected by the First Amendment. There was something inherently wrong and inconsistent with that picture. That's why we um, uh, ultimately decided to get into those lawsuits uh, on behalf of Kentuckians because we recognize that there seemed to be uh, a stark juxtaposition in the way that. Uh, Big box stores were being treated, again, not protected by the First Amendment, and, and churches and places of worship were being uh, being treated. Again, a, I've talked about this uh, pretty extensively. Two federal judges looked at this, uh, one who was appointed by President George W. Bush and another one that was appointed by President Obama. They both came to independent judgments uh, that the church ban was unconstitutional, in-person church ban was unconstitutional. So it didn't matter what the uh, president appointed you and the president's political affiliation, it was just based on the law. Uh, and so we have in every instance endeavored that in Kentucky, we are striking the right balance as it relates to uh, the public health concerns, which are legitimate, but also uh, protecting the constitutional rights of citizens here in Kentucky. We think we're striking that balance right uh, appropriately uh, and, uh, and continue to do so uh, even in these most recent uh, suits that we have joined. We're talking with Kentucky Attorney General Daniel Cameron. Uh, Attorney General, I want to talk to you a little bit about the Breonna Taylor situation. I mean, I, as you well know, I mean, I'm, it's, how could you not? You know, the world is kind of watching what happens with this particular case. And I know that you you guys are investigating, taking a look at it. 
Um, I think most recently you said that, uh, that the investigation was still ongoing. Can you tell us where that stands right now? Yeah, you know, I can't get into specifics, but again, we have a, um, a team of folks that are work on, working on this uh, case. Uh, and we, uh, in all facets of this office, what I've endeavored to do uh, is to try to approach this office uh, without fear or favor, uh, make sure that we are doing a thorough job uh, in investigating all matters that come through this office. We are certainly undertaking a thorough investigation as it relates to Ms. Brianna Taylor. Uh, that is what you should expect of this office, uh, and that's what all Kentuckians uh, and, quite frankly, the country deserve. And so we have been uh, conducting our independent investigation. We've obviously uh, received uh, and an investigation public integrity unit from uh, uh, Louisville Metro. Uh, but we are also undertaking a separate uh, investigation as well. Uh, so we are, are, are working uh, diligently to make sure that we can uh, uh, wrap that up uh, and, and do that, uh, but again, in a thorough way uh, that recognizes that uh, we have a responsibility to get the facts right before uh, we make any sort of, of judgments as to what next steps are. But I hope people, once this process is, is done, know that we have uh, un uh, uh, uncovered and uh, flipped, up, flipped over every stone uh, and made sure that uh, we've done everything we possibly can to get to uh, the truth, again, which I believe that every Kentuckian uh, should expect from this office. Can, can you give us an idea as to how much longer or how close it might be before there's a resolution with your investigation? Because people are anxious and, and uh, they're watching closely. And, and I, I mean, I could just tell you from the people that reached out to me, they do feel like that the longer this goes, that they have a sense that, that there's not going to be justice. I'm not sure that's necessarily a fair assessment. Just that's how people feel, though. Can you give us an idea as to, as to where, you know, how close might we be hearing something about uh, what the investigation finds? Yeah, Larry, I, I, I can't do that. I, what I, what I want to make sure that this office is in the business of doing is and conducting a thorough investigation. We don't want to do anything to, to harm or hamper that investigation. But I want people to know uh, that the reason that we have uh, been so thorough and, and deliberate in our uh, review of this matter uh, is because we want to get to the truth and that when we come forward uh, with our judgments and decisions, I hope people will respect the fact uh, that we've done everything we possibly can uh, to get to the truth of this matter as it relates to Ms. Taylor. We had, we had a caller earlier, last hour, Charles, that, that, that wondered about, about the, uh, the officers working under the no-knock warrant and, and if they're acting on behalf of, of their superiors' orders and using a tactic that's, that's accepted. You know, what, what culpability is there? I mean, how, how can, can police officers, in, in a general sense, be held responsible if they're acting on the behalf of the orders of others or are using a tactic that's, that's accepted, a practice that's, that's accepted. In a general sense, is, does that complicate an investigation? Well, what I'll say on that front is that uh, we have, uh, you know, made it clear that we are looking at every uh, aspect and component of, of this case and not uh, just the, um, the incident uh, of the shooting of, of Ms. Uh, Taylor, but also leading up to the shooting and uh, a post shooting. So that that is something consistent with uh, what I think you should expect from an investigation uh, out of uh, the uh, uh, the attorney general's office. And so every point, every part uh, of the investigation uh, is being conducted. Again, we do this alongside uh, uh, our federal partners, the FBI, uh, who looks is looking to this matter as well. Attorney General, I appreciate the time. Thank you very much. Look forward to talking Thank to you, you soon. All right.